So my favorite subjects are acne and rosacea, and that's what I'm gonna talk about my other two lectures here. But every now and, now and then, Joe, and thank you for the invitation again, Joe, I very much appreciate being here. I get asked to do one additional lecture, and this year it's cosmeceuticals. And that is a challenge for me. Are any of you guys challenged with the idea of cosmeceuticals? Yeah? By the way, it's so good to see real faces out there. So let's have a little audience participation. I've been talking to a computer for, what, a year and a half now. So I went ahead and stuck my usual conflict of interest statement in here. Really, I guess my only conf conflict of interest today is that I'm getting older, so I'm really extra interested in cosmeceuticals and also that I do dispense products in my practice. But I'm not really gonna be talking about any specific brands today. In case, in, in fact, I've got 15 minutes. So what are we gonna talk about? We're gonna just pick three products today. We're gonna to pick Bacuchiol, Cystamine, and Silamarin. Bacuchiol, Cystamine, and Silamarin. Are you guys familiar with all of this? Or at least some of them, I bet. Okay, so Bacuchiol, I haven't seen you in person in a long time. I now want to hear you. This is a very fun word to say. I think it releases endorphins when we say it. Let me hear you say Bacuchiol. Very good. Now, I also thought maybe one of the wisest things I could tell you today is I'm going to give you this word, and I want to challenge you to use this in a sentence today. Okay, here's an example. We're in Vegas. Did you just get a load of that Bacucci all over there? <laughs> and then I thought about wearing a lavalier microphone because everybody else has been walking around, but I was afraid with the shirt my Bacucci all might show. And so we're going to stick with behind the podium today. But find a way to use Bacucci all in a sentence today. I think it'll release endorphins, and, and you can come up with all kinds of euphemistic ways to use that. But what is Bacucci all? So Bacucci all is a botanical. It is from the plant and other plants, but not, not just this one. Cerulea, Corallifloria. I was hoping that I could get that out. That's almost as good as the Bacucciol itself. And it's kind of known as the botanical retinoid. So it does have retinoid-like effects. Now, I want to pause right there and say I think one of the reasons I have a problem with cosmeceuticals is that I don't have a problem with their comparators, which are the gold standards. So here, what are we saying? We're saying this product might work like the retinoids. I love the retinoids. I use them all the time. In fact, raise your hand if you're using a topical retinoid. You know, I think when we're in a group of dermatologists, that's very common. But this would be a botanical retinoid, something that you could get without a prescription. But it does work through some of the pathways that the retinoids work through. It can modulate retinoic acid receptor genes, including things that upregulate collagen and things that would increase extracellular matrix synthesis enzymes. It's anti-inflammatory, it's antioxidant, and it can even be anti-acne. But do we have any evidence? Again, part of what's hard about cosmeceuticals, and I, I joked with my husband, and anyone who's here from the cosmeceutical world, I love you, and I do use your products, and I dispense them, but I told my husband, I said, I've gotta give this first lecture, and it's kinda like, okay, now we're gonna talk about things that might work, but we don't have any evidence. Uh, but that's not true. We do have some evidence here. So I like studies. This is a comparative study. Now, we're not looking at Bacucciol versus Tretinoin. You'll notice that. We're looking at Bacucciol versus Retinol. So this is randomized, though. That's good news. It's radar-blinded. It is not double-blinded because Bacucciol is going to be used BID, and the Retinol is just going to be used at night. But what do you think is going to happen? Are we going to see similar results between Bacucciol being used twice a day and retinol just being used at night. And they did a good job, I think, in the design of this study. This was photographs that were taking and taken, and then a lot of the assessment wasn't by the naked eye, it was actually image analysis. So looking at things like wrinkles and pigmentation. And what they found at the end is that both Bacucciol and retinol significantly decreased wrinkle surface area involvement and they decreased hyperpigmentation, and there was not a statistically significant difference between the two. Now let's keep in mind, this was not a huge study, 44 people, so it might be hard to show a statistically significant difference, but look at the very bottom. So this would be something that Bacucciol would hang its hat on, and that is that the retinol users reported more facial stinging and more facial uh, scaling. And so Bacucciol, we already, you know, if you can't tolerate a retinoid, you might try a retinol, but what if you can't tolerate a retinol? Maybe you can look for a product that has something like Bacucciol in it. 
And let's just look at some of the graphs. So this is looking specifically at wrinkles. And this, again, is image analysis. This was not an investigator. And what you can see here, the Bacuccio is the little triangle, and the retinol is the square. But over time, both of these improve wrinkles. Now, you know, I'm, I'm such a, a skeptic. I can't help it. Don't you wonder if maybe it was just the vehicle that was doing this? But I will tell you, the vehicle was the same in both. They actually formulated the product so they had the exact same vehicle. And so you can see maybe a, a numerical difference between the two, but not a statistically significant difference. The little asterisk you see at week 12 is statistical significance against baseline. So both of these worked compared to baseline not a statistical significance between, between the two. This may, sh may be a little bit hard to see, but the, the numbers that I have on the right are the same thing the graph is. Just saying, who had improvement in pigmentation? Was it more in one arm than the other? 59% of Bacucciol group had improvement in pigmentation and 44% in the retinol group. Again, not a statistically significant difference. But when you looked at scaling, now there was a difference. So the tall black bars there, that's all retinoid, retinol. Excuse me, about 20% of people here did have scaling in the retinol group. And it was much lower, statistically significantly lower in the Bacucciol group. Now, what's interesting, with retinoids, what do we think? We think that we're going to see scaling early and then it's going to get better. You know, I don't want to make too much of this, but at least the Bacucciol kind of started out lower and then it went up a little bit by week 12. But at every time point, there was more scaling with the retinol than there was with Bacucciol. But this is interesting. This is interesting, but more erythema with Bacucciol. Only at week four. But it made me think, you know, okay, if I am going to talk to patients, because sometimes we have patients who come in and say, you know, let's say it's a rosacea patient. And they can be a little tricky to introduce some cosmeceutical because their skin is so sensitive. And maybe they want to use a retinoid, and you're like, uh, I'm not sure I'm ready yet. By the way, I do use retinoids in rosacea. They can help the rosacea. We just don't start with that. We get the rosacea under control and then add it later. But maybe you were thinking about Bacucciol. I might pause here. Because if there's more redness with that than there is with the retinol, maybe that's not the perfect perfect fit for that. Okay, how about cystamine? I bet some of you here use cystamine. Do some of you use cystamine? Raise your hand real high if you use it for hyperpigmentation. Okay, I don't know that I see a single hand. Well, did I see somebody back? Okay, I see somebody back there. Okay, so cystamine is um, an intrinsic antioxidant. It's anti-mutagenic. It is a potent depigmenting agent. Look at the second from the bottom. I just added this this morning because I think it's so interesting. Cystamine hydrochloride injected into the skin of the black goldfish caused depigmentation. Now, that was done way back in 1966. So we've known for a long time that this cystamine hydrochloride is a good depigmenter. But it's also a thiol-based compound, and it stinks. Okay, it really, I mean, it smells. There is a problem with that. And so it has recently been reformulated over the last few years. The smell is better. You also don't leave this on the skin for long periods of time. It's kind of a short contact kind of treatment. But it's potent depigmenting. It does that by inhibiting both tyrosinase and peroxidase. It can augment intracellular levels of glutathione. So what about studies? We have studies now that look at cystamine versus placebo. But then we're going to go against the gold standard. What's the gold standard in pigment? That is not a rhetorical question. What is the gold standard in pigment? Hydroquinone. So we're going to look at head-to-head -head studies against hydroquinone too. But this is versus placebo, so we have randomized. That's good. Double-blind. That's good. Vehicle-controlled study. 50 patients, 25 people in each group. They did this every night for four months, and in this case, they left it on for three hours. The products that we're using and talking more about now are left on for about 15 minutes. But evaluations were done using a meximeter, looking at the melasma area and severity index, or the Massey scores, the IGAs, the investigators' global assessment, and patient questionnaires. And I don't know how well this shows up, but what we're looking at here, first of all, the, the left, we see the hypopigmentation grading. And a one means nothing happened, a two means maybe mild improvement, a three means moderate improvement, and the four means excellent, almost gone. When you move over, we're seeing what the investigators said about. So what we want to see is from uh, the cystamine group, we want to see a lot of people in the three and four, okay, lots of people who have improved. And in fact, if you look at that with placebo, it's only, what, 4% of people who maybe improved a little bit, but if you look at the cystamine group, it's 84% of people. And then even when you look to see what the patients said about it, 
more people in the cystamine group said that their, their hyperpigmentation improved than those in the placebo group. And this is, okay, these are three different people. I think those bottom two pictures look like it's one face. This is three different people. On the left, it's all the, all the befores. And on the right, it's all the afters after 16 weeks of using cystamine topically. And I think you can look at the lip on the bottom picture. You, you get a little distracted there because you know she still has melasma. But really, look, the intensity of this is a lot better. I think the two forehead pictures show it really well. And then this is the same person, two different sides of the cheek. The photography is a little bit different there. This is somebody who had had melasma for over 10 years. And so certainly an improvement here. But what about cystamine 5% cream versus hydroquinone, our gold standard, 4%? So this is double-blind, randomized trial. 20 people, you know, that's a little bit of a problem, and only 14 completed the study. So we had five people using cystamine and nine people using hydro hydroquinone. They did an interesting thing here, though. So they really wanted to keep this double-blind. They didn't want the, the subject to know, you know, because if you think about how we're going to use these, we're going to tell the cystamine group of people to leave the product on 15 minutes and wash it off, but we're not going to tell the hydroquinone group that. And so to keep this blinded, everybody got two products. And the first product, whether it was the real one or the vehicle, they left it on for 15 minutes and washed it off. And then they were given a second cream. Some people got real hydro hydroquinone, some people got the vehicle, and they left that one on. So everybody applied two things every night for four months. And both of these re re reduced the Massey scores. They were um, not statistically significant between the two. Look at that last bullet point, though. In this case, hydroquinone was the better tolerated. Now, I don't want to make too much of that. When you look into this paper, you know, the, the tolerability things were like mild erythema, mild irritation. And how many people were using cystamine? Five. Okay, so we don't want to draw too many conclusions from that, but there was not a statistically significant difference efficacy-wise. We also don't want to draw too much of a conclusion from that because the end of the study was so very low. Uh, this is just looking at the, the change from baseline. This just really wraps up what I just said, so we won't spend any more time on that. Pictures are what we like to see. So this is somebody in the cystamine arm. Can you see that? Can you see the improvement? So we have the person at baseline, they use this every night for 16 weeks, leaving it on 15 minutes and then washing it off. They are also, by the way, using sun protection in all of these studies, they are also using sun protection. Uh, that last study was just published in 2021, this one is from 2020. This is another comparative study looking at cystamine versus hydroquinone 4%. And in this case, the hydroquinone was superior, but the, the cystamine product did show effect and both of the products were very well tolerated. Okay, and we'll finish up just briefly with silymarin. I think that's another tricky one to say. Are you asleep? Say silymarin. Silymarin. You know, do you ever like, I'm gonna admit something. Sometimes I don't know how to say these and so you like go on YouTube and you watch somebody say it. Does anybody else ever do that? I can't believe I just said that up here, but you know, when you don't know how to say it, you, you hmm. am I saying all these right, Joe? Yeah, he's, he's giving me the thumbs up. Okay, so silymarin is extract of milk thistle. And when you look this one up, this one has some effect potentially on the liver. You hate to say too much about that because there's not great, great studies to support this. But you'll see this used orally for things like cirrhosis, alcoholic liver disease, hepatitis. But in the dermatology world, we're really talking about using this topically. And so topically, this would be an antioxidant. This would be anti-inflammatory. This can do all kinds of things. I found this uh, nice publication from 2018. On this, there's too many words, so only look at the italicized part, and there's going to be two slides. So silymarin, antioxidant properties, and then go down about halfway, anti-inflammatory effects of silymarin, immunomodulatory effects of silymarin, this is a biggie, photoprotection and DNA repair effects of silymarin. Some people would say this has a, a, a photoprotective and maybe even uh, helps to prevent actinic keratoses or skin cancer. Effect of silymarin on EGFR-mediated mitogen signaling, inhibition of melanin synthesis. So, you know, when you look at these long lists of potentially the way these products would work, um, it makes you think maybe we could use them in a lot of places. And in fact, in the same publication, what was listed as skin cancer, sunscreen, melasma, rosacea, acne, cosmeceuticals, wound healing. So lots of potential uses for this. 
but they also were very honest here. And what's in parentheses after these diagnoses is the level of evidence to support it. And so we like those one A's and one B's, and we see a one B by acne, and we see a one B by melasma, and other than that, we really don't have great evidence. So, okay, Bacuchiol, remember, I want you to use that in a sentence today, you know, and I think you're gonna have ample opportunity to do that. In fact, if you'd like to email me one of your sentences, I'd really be happy to, to receive that. We talked about cystamine, and I think that gives us another option to use in hyperpigmentation and melasma, which can be so tough. And then silymarin, probably in particular, we're gonna be using it for photoprotection, but maybe also in acne. Thank you so much.